And there are all these different words for the Fulani. So the Fulani, Fulbi, Fulfulbi, Pular, Gula, all of those, and Tsukalor, they all refer to the same people. It is a Niger Congo language group uh, who are pastoralists. So they would herd animals instead of um, living in a, a settled way. And as a result, they are scattered all over West Africa. And that's unlike any other tribal group. And although they don't have a majority in any single country, but they are uh, very large because they're spread over so many countries. And they uh, spread eastward and southward from the 16th through the 19th centuries and uh, emphasized a strong practice of standard Islam. So this is their population per country. So the largest population is in Nigeria because that's the country with the largest population in the area by far. So they are 8.6% of all of Nigeria, 40% of Ghana, 23.8% of Senegal. And you go down here, you can see they're also 20% of Guinea-Bissau, 18% of Gambia, and so on, 10.6% of Burkina Faso. So they, they quite a uh, large number of people, and they often follow the Tijani Sufi order. And they were also famous or notorious for founding many states in West Africa. And these states are looked back on by modern followers of statism who are West African Muslims sometimes uh, fondly as examples of, yes, we had states too. Uh, other people might not think so highly of them. Uh, but anyhow, these were the, the, the list of the states that were founded by them. And these states, as you go down the list, became uh, larger in size. So the Sokoto Caliphate, founded by Afman Danfobio in Nigeria, reached the maximum size. And of these states, that is the one which still sort of maintains a shadow existence in that the Caliph of Sokoto is still there in Nigeria because he was not removed uh, by the British and then the subsequent independent state continues to regard him as having some moral authority, even though he doesn't have an actual political position because, of course, the state has its own secular political divisions and government. But the Sokolo Caliph continues to have some influence there. Um, this is Guinea, which is the state sort of in an odd shape that formed in the French uh, had formed, and this shows where the uh, different uh, linguistic groups are. So, Pil here are the Fulanis. This is Puta Jalon. That is the Fulani kingdom. And this is kind of a detailed history that I went into, which I can skip over because this shows Puta Jalon what the geography is, because I was talking about this person. How many of you know him? of him, Abdur Rahman. This is a uh, prince of Futa Jalon, a son of the king who was captured in an expedition and sold to slavery in America and ended up in a plantation in Mississippi. And then when it was discovered that he could read uh, and write Arabic, um, there was uh, a campaign that was made in the 1820s to liberate him uh, because it was thought that he was a civilized person. And uh, people, because they didn't believe that uh, Africans from south of the Sahara could be civilized, sort of misidentified him as a Moor, meaning a Moroccan, a, a citizen of the kingdom of Morocco. So a big campaign was undertaken to free him. But he lived in America so long that he had quite a family in America of, of uh, wife and children and so on, and didn't want to leave them. And this even reached the government and President John Quincy Adams, uh, who supported him, but then disowned him when he found that he was not really a Moroccan and was offended by that. Meanwhile, Abdurrahman promised to uh, be a good Christian and go and preach Christianity in Africa if only he could be returned to his original homeland. So at first they sent some letter to the king of Morocco, uh, the sultan of Morocco, asking him to, to you know, take back his subject. But then they realized that he was really from there. So at the end of his life, 
when the Americans had founded the project of Liberia in, uh, starting from 1820. In 1829, he went back to Liberia and where he was supposed to preach Christianity. And as soon as he got on the land, he said, bye-bye. Yeah. But he unfortunately then died after a couple of months and never got back to his home. Mm -hmm. So that's his history. So that was something that I, I covered. Uh, but I think here we, in the interest of time, better speak along to other things. So these are the Fulani states around 1830. And these states were called Fulani Jihad states. And that meant that every one of those four states there was uh, created with the idea of uh, establishing the state and purifying the land by uh, conquering other people and making them conform to Islam. And usually, the people that were conquered were already Muslims. And so the, they would protest and say, but we're already Muslims. So the conquering state would say, but you aren't good enough Muslims. And that led especially to an interesting exchange between the uh, caliph of Sokoto and the ruler of Kanem Bornu, which you'll remember had been a Muslim kingdom for hundreds and hundreds of years. Well, Kanem Bornu, like the other Muslim kingdoms, had continued a lot of non-Islamic practices, which is exactly what the Fulani jihad states were complaining about. But it had happened also that there had been recently a political revolution in Kanem Bornu, and a person called Muhammad al kanemi had become the ruler who was actually a religious scholar in his own right. And so when the summons was sent out by Sokoto that you aren't good Muslims, so we have to fight you, or you have to submit, he argued back, well, it's true we're not perfect Muslims, because who could be perfect, you know? But you're really being hypocritical in making this attack. And that was a very big challenge to this caliphate of Sokoto. I think today that part of the problem is that people, because of the way all of us are imbued with nation-statism and nationalism, and everybody, even if they reject that, this is the uh, world that we've grown up in, and so we cannot escape from it, and it affects our minds in ways that we can't uh, imagine. Uh, everybody likes to see, oh, we have to have some kind of great state on the map. So almost every nationality has some kind of picture of some huge map claiming everything and uh, you know, claiming some huge area as their territory. And uh, harking back to the glories of some previous medieval or ancient kingdom that they supposedly belong to. And just to give an example, I remember seeing on television once this Georgian couple uh, shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the independence of Georgia in 1991, who showed this Georgian nationalist map claiming territory from all their neighbors, from the Russian Federation to the north, from Azerbaijan to the east, from Armenia to the south, and also from Turkey. And it, it, it basically huge territory saying this was all Georgian. And when they were asked or challenged by the interviewer, uh, but the people in all these areas don't speak Georgian. They belong to other nationalities. And they, their reply was very uh, charming, I thought, that they said, Oh, with no problem, all these people, when they realize how wonderful Georgian nationalism is and how they're really Georgians, but they don't know it, they'll all just come welcoming the greater Georgia. And, uh, they, uh, and then you see even all of the malign wars that that has led to as Georgia has tried to nail down the, uh, the uh, autonomous republics which have different ethnic groups living in them inside that were inside its Soviet republic formerly in them. Some of those escaped from its grasp because of conflict with Russia and so on. And how they have conflicts with Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, over uh, a territory, not with Turkey, but the, the others. Uh, that kind of shows that. Well, everybody likes to put up something on the map like that. So West African Muslims today also would think, oh, great caliphate of Sokoto. That validates us and shows we had a state. And actually, considering that Africans in particular are always 
suffering from the idea, oh, you people weren't civilized. You didn't have great states. See, well, is having great states really a marker of civilization or barbarism? Is it really a marker of, of a great uh, a deal of success that you have a great state? Because the states are erected by the rulers and the uh, military and the administrators and all of those kind of governmental people, which as um, Howell and Howell's Moving Castle, if any of you have seen that Miyazaki, wonderful Miyazaki cartoon film, when uh, Sophie tells Howell, who has been summoned to go to the king, uh, well, why don't you just go to the king and explain things to him and, and that, you know, he will stop this stupid war and all. And Howell's comment is, you have no idea what these people are really like, which I think is an excellent expression. In fact, I'd love to have a clip of that that I can stick in some of my PowerPoints and my students. But um, uh, so anyway, that I think uh, the heritage of the idea of statism is at least a mixed one. 